وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء أما بعد respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Inshallah as we approach the second last night before we remember the tragedy of Karbala and the day in which the tragedy occurred. Inshallah, during this series of lectures, we've talked about many aspects in which we need to learn from. As in, we've covered aspects in which we can learn from the world of jinn. We learned aspects that are haram and their effects such as music. We understood what it means to be free through the eyes of Imam Hussein. We looked at particular figures which we can hold on to, whether it be a male or a female, which we looked at Abu Fadl al-Abbas, and we looked at Sayyida Zainab, and a bit of depth in their lives and what we need to learn from them to become better people and indeed better Muslims. Now someone can come and say, well, I've learned all this. I understand where I want to be. I understand what I need to be. And I see faults in myself. However, what's the next step to take in order that I may first and foremost replenish myself? And on the second level, elevate in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And indeed, a step that we all need to take. And in accordance to the importance of this month, the importance and the great blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instilled in this month when you cry one tea for Abu Abdullah. But inshallah, we'll look at the rewards more so tomorrow. But tonight, we'd like to shed a light on the beautiful, let's say, gift or blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which we, He has blessed us with, which is dua, which can be interchanged with the concept of salat. But for the sake of the lecture for tonight, let's look at the concept of dua as we know it. Now, before getting into the actual gist of the topic of how to make dua, what are the steps we need to first and foremost look at before making dua? How can we allow our dua to be accepted? What are the criteria? And then secondly, looking at after we reach this criteria, are there any particular factors in which will veil our dua from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? But indeed, before we begin that, we need to first shed a light on how effective dua can be. And I've been asked on many occasions throughout the lecture series this Muharram to talk about a concept better known as predestination versus free will. So we'll stop at that station and see the effect that dua may have on the concept of predestination versus free will. So inshallah, after we look at predestination and free will as the first step, then we'll go into the detail of dua within the time limit that we have for tonight. So please help me in, in starting tonight's topic by reciting aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. <laughs> Predestination versus free will. It occupies a large percentage of our Islamic libraries. And there's many different opinions that come forth to allude to different factors. Now we find some opinions come to serve a particular agenda. Other opinions come from mere stupidity. And then we have the concept in which is the theory of Ahlul Bayt, or the followers of Ahlul Bayt. Now the two extremes we have, one side complete predestination, the other side complete free will. Now the school of thought that comes... The school of thought that comes forth and states that it's absolute predestination is the Ash'arite school of thought. Now when we look at the brother school of thought, let's, let's call, even though they have different scholars that they look up to, within their school and within their theology, they split into two main schools of theology, one being the Ash'arite and one being the Mu'tazilite. It doesn't matter who you fall under as a scholar, whether it be Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanafi or Hanbali. You fall under two the the theoretical and jurisprudential schools, which is the Ash'arites and the Mu'tazilites. The Ash'arites are of the opinion 
that it's something called absolute predestination. Everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything that happens within this earth, Allah has already written down. And then we have the Mu'tazilites, everything, you're free to do whatever you want. Anything that you've pleased, you can do, because Allah doesn't, it's open script, you can do whatever you want. Then this school of thought of Ahlul Bayt, the Ja'fari school of thought. Now let's look at the, the bad effects or stuff that we can look at within the school of thought that agrees for predestination or as absolute predestination. When we have one of the scholars of the four schools going towards the house of Imam, Al-Sadiq alayhi afdhul salati wa salam And Imam Kadhim comes out And he tells that scholar My dad's a little busy, can I help you? At a young age A very famous tradition but it shows us the effects Of predestination and how it can be nullified So Abu Hanifa looks At the little Imam Kadhim little, little in age, not in wisdom obviously and he says, I have a question for your father. He's thinking he's just going to tell his father. He says, if we were to commit a sin, is it just us? Is it us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or is it, is it just Allah as in predestined? Everything's predestined. So the imam replies very beautifully. He says, if it's only Allah that's committing the sin or is forcing you to commit the sin, or if Allah has a hand in allowing you or forcing you to commit a sin, then where is the basis of heaven and hell? As if Allah has forced you to do this particular bad deed, or forced you to do this good deed, why is it that He's punishing you and rewarding you on that basis? And if He's punishing you, how is it that He's not punished? Well, billah. A logical answer, He says, the only thing that stands to reason is that you solely committed that act of treason or that act which is sinful, or that blessing which is a reward. Young age replies beautifully, takes everything that is predestination clean out of existence. Because he says, first and foremost, if there's such a thing as complete predestination, and you had no choice in what you were to, were to do on this earth, then Allah should not have created a heaven and a hell, because everything's already predestined. Yazid can come forth and he say, why are you commemorating Muharram? Because Allah is already predestined for me to kill Imam Hussein. Easily. The Khulafa. That's why they utilized the ideology which is predestination. Anyone goes up to an Umayyad Khalifa, tells him, Why are you sitting on the throne of Ahl al Bayt? Bahlul gives us a beautiful example. Harun al Rashid once left the courtroom. Bahlul at the time, he, as we know, pretends to be insane. He runs up to the courtroom, he sits on the throne of Harun al-Rashid, and everyone knows the extent of the prosecution of Harun. We don't need to go into the depth of that. But he comes and sees Bahlul on his throne, as we say, or the pulpit, or in his chair. So he has him dragged down, moments he sat, dragged down and beaten. Insane, you're not supposed to prosecute someone that's insane. He still has him beaten. And then you find Bahlul firstly crying, then smiling. And Harun looks at him and says, well, what's going on? You're getting beaten and you're smiling. He says, look, look, look at the effect. He says, I've only for moments sat on a throne that does not belong to me. And look what's happened to me, beaten. And look at my state. He says, you sat on that throne your whole life. Look at what punishment awaits you on the day of judgment. So that's an example that we have from Bahlul. Giving us an idea and an ideology to look into which people take forth to serve their agenda. Predestination. Allah has already predestined for me to take this throne. Allah has already predestined for me to kill this person. Allah has already predestined for me to make that sin. Therefore, if I go towards a haram act, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's allowed me to do that, such a thing or written for me to do such a thing. That makes absolutely no sense when looking at heaven and hell. As in why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring forth messengers in the first place? Why did he bring a Quran to tell us this is right from wrong? Do this and don't do this. If it's already predestined what we will do and will, what we won't do, isn't it? One ideology 
put it aside. Let's look at the other one. Free will, absolute free will is already overlooked. Because a person, when you ask him, were you, uh, were you asked when you are to be born? Or did Allah ask you when he wants to take your life? Did you choose which parents to be born into? Did you choose whether you want to be a male or a female when, bring, when brought into this world? And he doesn't answer those questions, meaning in the first level, and you don't have to go further than that, is they have absolutely no free will in that context. Therefore, how can you have absolute free will? So where does the justice lie? Where does theology tell us predestination is, and where is the aspect of free will? So Imam Sadiq has asked this question. He says, where does the school of Ahl al-Bayt stand in this instant? And the reply of Imam Sadiq was very beautiful. He says to the person that's asking, lift one leg. So he lifts the leg. He says, lift the other leg at the same time. He says, I'll fall down. He says, that's exactly how predestination and free will works. Some things you have control over. Other things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the control. As in, first and foremost, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't ask you when he brings you towards this earth. Allah doesn't ask you before he chooses for you a mother and a father. Allah doesn't ask you when he will take your life. Allah doesn't ask you what calamities he puts you in. What fitan. And therefore, what, what do we find the free will in? In the choices that we make. Allah puts paths in front of you. He tells you, each path I will test you. What do we know? And especially when he loves someone, he keeps testing him. We have a narration stating that if Allah loves a servant, he will give him a harder test and a harder test. And every time he passes, he gives him a harder test and a harder test. Why? To elevate his rank on the day of judgment. To wipe out from his sin. That's why when we looked at the night of Abu Fadl al-Abbas, the idea of knowledge... And when we looked in the night of Sayyidah Zainab, the aspect of patience goes hand in hand with knowledge. And we'll look at it, inshallah, after two examples that we give to wrap it all together. Why knowledge is such an amazing aspect when looking at this particular theory? Now, when people come and say, well, if Allah has already predestined everything, will our choices change anything that's been predestined? And the answer is yes. We, with our actions, can change something that's predestined. There's two different lowest. One, a scripture with, which is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And another scripture which is with the angels. The scripture which is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is untouched. The one with the angels constantly changing. You can see Malik al maut one day has his list that he's taking the lives of tonight. And as we know, five times in narrations, Five times every night Malik al Maut comes, waits, tells Allah, want me to take that person's life now or tomorrow? Five times. So that's the first level. Now when we look at in more depth, the aspect of dua, the aspect of patience, the aspect of how we can change something that's already been predestined, the Imams come and tell us, of the things that can change something that's already been predestined is number one, Salat al-Rahim. Imam Zayn al-Abidin tells us there was two companions that came, one that enjoined relations, one that cut him off. He tells that companion, he tells him, Allah has increased your life by 30 years for you enjoining relations. And to the other person, he has minimized your life by 30 years because you cut relations. So automatically we know that yes, our actions that we do on earth have a direct impact with what's been predestined. And Allah can change it as He wishes. Now, where does dua or the power of dua or the concept of dua play? Or what role does it play in the idea of predestination versus free will? Now, as we know, if we look at the schools of thought, let's look at the schools of thought. You bring forth every single religion now. There's two things that signify and elevate the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt above any other. 
And you can bring this into any debate and challenge anyone to these particular two points. What are they? Number one, the fact that we have the best role models. And I'm saying even when you get, let's say, a Christian and you tell them, what do you say about Jesus, son of Mary? And let's compare it to what we say about Jesus, son of Mary. Mind you, when they take him to be divine, they look at his qualities. They look at his divine character, his morals, his ethics. And that's why they gave him well, a rank of divinity. But when you compare Isa in the Quran to Isa in the Bible, you'll see a huge difference of the miracles that Isa in the Quran had in comparison to the miracles in the Bible. As if when you go towards the church, ask them one simple question before getting into depth. Tell them, do you or do you not believe that Jesus, son of Mary, spoke in infancy? And the reply will be, we have no such thing. And how can you say a child spoke at infancy? Where you find that the Quran states it. Bible says, no way. How can an infant speak in infancy? So automatically you know when we have role models and when I stress the fact that we have better role models, I'm saying compare them to anyone and even their role models, but look at it through a Quranic perspective. Look at the idea of infallibility that we have, other schools don't have. Religion has infallibility, other religions don't have. So first and foremost, the ranks, the role models that we have, because we follow in their footsteps, no mistakes. Other people follow in footsteps that do have mistakes. Therefore, our level in which we have to reach is much higher. Number one. Number two, something that's very attached. And if you want to look at it, copyrighted to the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt. And that's the concept of dua that we have. Dua is the one aspect that we have that you won't find in any other school of thought. The supplications. If compared to any other munajat in any other school, you won't find something that comes close to one line from Dua Kumail. Anything that will come close to one line from Dua Abu Hamza Thumali, one line from Dua Al Sabah, one line from Sahif al Sajjadiyya. And that's why we have to look into this aspect that we've been neglecting. When we have jewels and gems, the words in which our infallibles talked with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we need to understand that the Quran is number one in importance. Reading, learning, understanding to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at a spiritual level, if we want to increase spiritually, if we want to humble ourselves, if we want to gain closeness towards Allah, you look at any dua and you will begin to realize how the Imams talk towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and see how much we are arrogant, how much we are stingy, how much we lack in our personalities and character when we compare ourselves just by the words of how the Imams used to talk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the concept of dua, how can we apply it? How can we utilize everything that we've learned and make a dua tonight to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to remove ourselves from the path of shaitan and go towards the path of Imam Hussein? What are the prerequisites? What are the effects? Can anyone come and make dua? Now someone comes and asks a question. Because we look at our society nowadays, the question always arises that I always make dua, but Allah doesn't answer my dua. We have examples from the Quran, from the Hadith, from real life scenarios, and I have so many, but I only have 10 minutes to share everything with you before we finish. I'll give you one example that's actually a real life event. And if you can take this, to be a reference point, I guarantee you, this seeming impossible, if you want to apply it to your life and saying, well, look at the tragedy that I have, 
you'll begin to say that Allah has a beacon of light awaiting for me. This happened to one of our ulama. Back in his days, it didn't have medical advances in which we can check the state of someone. This alama once was asleep and his friends came. It was a particular medical condition in which your heartbeat lowers into such a state where it's barely visible, barely visible. And you're in an unconscious state of mind. So we could say the closest thing is someone that's unconscious with a very, very low pulse. His friends come around him and they can't find the pulse. So automatically they see this alam is, is passed, he's gone towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as you know, it's not like here in Sydney. The rituals take time. The applications take time. The burials take time upon time. So there's a large gap in which the dead isn't buried. But back in our countries, you find that the person, if he passes away within a couple of hours, they've done the salat, they've done the ghusl, and he's buried. So this alama, imagine this, he's still alive. They've washed him. They've shrouded him. They've put him in his grave. Once they've put him in his grave, they've piled the sand on top of him, and they've left him. Imagine, I want you to put yourself into that person's position, in the grave. Imagine waking up, because one day we'll all wake up in our graves. But we won't be alive in the sense that we can go back towards the dunya and do that which we need in our graves. But I need you to put yourself in that person's position. You're alive. Six feet under, you wake up. All the doors are closed then, isn't it? As in, how are you going to dig yourself out? You are wrapped so tightly in the shroud. And you have sand. You can barely breathe. Now we know when all the doors are shut in your face, there's always one door that's always remaining open, isn't it? The door of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when we know we don't need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or when we think we don't need Allah, the Qur'an remains on the shelf. It only comes out in Ramadan, in the funerals, or in a katb kitab. That's when we know the exact verses that we need to take out from the Holy Qur'an. Let's take it out, have some barakah, put it back in. Otherwise, when do we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if it's not in the tragedies when we need Him? That's why Allah stresses that remember me even in the good, not just the bad. When you remember me in the good, I will increase that which you have. So the person six feet under, imagine. No door but the door of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he goes towards Allah and he says, Oh Allah, I have a nither. He says, if you get me out of here, I don't know how you're going to get me out of here. I'm six feet under. No way out. I'm wrapped. He says, but I have another. If you get me out, I will write a translation of your holy Quran as soon as you get me out of here. Dua. Towards Allah. So look at the power. That person, we can argue that there and then Allah has prescribed that he would die. Six feet under. No way to get out. You're going to suffocate. So he prays to Allah. Make senator. Back then, and I think till, till now, we have people that their job are not necessarily the best of jobs. These people used to live on selling the shrouds that the people used to be shrouded in before they were buried. So this person found out that there's someone that was buried that night. So as soon as the Allama made that dua, that person goes towards that grave. He begins digging and digging and digging. Put yourself in the state of the alama. Imagine you hear someone outside, he's digging. You're straight away going to scream, please help me. Please assist me, I'm alive down here dying. But you have to remember, as soon as you make a sound, that person's thinking to himself, well, there's a jinn. Or I'm going to die. That's Malik al-Maut. He's digging up a grave. How on earth is there someone alive still under there? 
So the Allama remains very, very silent. Until an instance where he's dug up everything, he's reached the shroud, he's opened the shroud, and the person that's assumably dead grabs his hand. Imagine the state of that person. I don't think he ever went opening graves ever again. But on that instance, the Allama, he gets out, doesn't he, from a dua. And once he gets out, he writes a translation of the Holy Quran. And you can find it till tonight. The translation of Al Allama Tabrasi, you will find it. And it's a true story that I narrate to you. So we find the power of dua is there, yes, without a shadow of doubt. It can change something that's already been predestined. If we are going on the wrong path, let's use our tears. Imam Ali, what does he say? He says the people, he says there's two weapons in dua kumail. One weapon is your tears. Wasilahul buka. Your tears are a weapon. Second weapon, he has a narration stating that your dua is a lethal weapon. Use your dua. Use that combination. Weapon, weapon. Utilize it. Look at how much you can pray towards Allah to change something. That person, you may think it's impossible. Allah shows us on many instances that's nothing called impossible. Is that thing that you want greater or the, crea or the creator of all things? Keep that in the back of our mind. The example we've given from the Quran. When we look at the life of Zakaria, at an old age, no, could he have a child, no, could his wife. They both could not produce children, no, could they have children at an old age. Allah gives him dua, power, but not everyone. Ali ibn Abi Talib refers to us when he tells us in dua kumail, he says, Oh Allah, forgive me the sins that veil my dua, isn't it? Forgive me the sins that veil my dua. I could, I could want to be a better person. I may want to achieve greater things. I may want to be a better person. I may want to follow in the footsteps of Ahlul Bayt. And I make dua, and I make dua. However, if I have sins that veil my dua, how are they ever going to get answered? And that's why Ali ibn Abi Talib tells us in Dua Kumail that yes, there are sins that veil the Dua. One of these sins, backbiting. Another sin, music. Another sin. And we're known very, very, very well in this particular aspect, eating haram. Knowingly or unknowingly, it will have an effect on you in which it will veil your Dua. Your salah not accepted, 40 days, 40 nights. That's why there's so much stress being put on. Make sure you double check what you eat. Make sure you know the source. Because Imam al-Sadiq, we narrated yesterday, says about the enemies that fought Aba Abdullah, that their stomachs have been full of haram. And because of that, they went the opposite way. Dua. Now, there is stuff that can veil dua. Running out of time. There are things that we need to practice when making dua as well. Imam al Sadiq narrates to us very beautifully. He says there are particular things when you want to make dua towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you follow. But before we look into these instances, we want to touch up on the idea of knowledge. The idea of knowledge, when we said someone two nights ago, we said if someone was to become sick, many of us will take two different paths. One path being absolutely going out of religion altogether. Someone that's sick, their children are sick, they may have a deformity, they may have an illness. Straight away they say, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put me through this? Goes the other way. Out of religion altogether. As in I know first-hand people that say we don't pray anymore. And I ask them why. It says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did such and such to my child. And I can't handle this. And because Allah did this, I'm going away. But because how merciful is Allah when he does this to me? That is someone that doesn't have knowledge of Allah's mercy. When Allah comes and tells us that when he gives an illness to someone. But firstly, before that, in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 285, Allah already says, 
Allah does not burden a soul more than it can handle, isn't it? Now how can you come and say, well, I can't handle this. If Allah, the creator, says that I know that you can handle this. That's why I give you bala. That's why I test you. And every test has either one of two. Either when you're tested with an illness, with a calamity, with a burden, with a death, anything, hardship that you go through. Minus haram, obviously. Minus the haram, any hardship that you go through. Allah says there's either one of two. Either Allah is decreasing from your sins until you're purified. That's why, why do we look at, when we look at the people that, the females that give birth, all the trials and tribulations that they go through, childbirth, the pain. Allah says as soon as you've given birth, your sins are wiped because of the hardship. Idea is hardship, removal of sins. No sins, Allah says, I'm elevating your rank. It's a win-win scenario. And that's why when a person comes towards the Prophet of Islam and he asks him, he says, I love you, O Rasulullah. What did Rasulullah reply with? Lil-Fakr. Prepare yourself for poverty in my time. If you love me, prepare for poverty. What does he say then? He says, then I love Ali ibn Abi Talib. Look what he says. He says, Istadda lil bala. Prepare yourself for calamities. Prepare yourself for fitna after fitna after fitna. Prepare yourself. Because I'll reward you on your firm stand. I'll reward you for remembering. I'll reward you for following in the footstep even though it's so hard. That's an instance. So if we have knowledge, we would have more patience. If we have knowledge, we thank Allah for the blessing that He's given us. That's one aspect. Now, what to do when making dua? What to do? Imam Sadiq, in a cumulative of traditions, comes forth with four main points. Number one, he says, first and foremost, when you want to make dua towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, go and make wudu. Purify yourself. You don't want to be in a state when you're asking something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be a state of impurity, be in a state of purity, number one. Number two, when you're making dua, face the qibla. Number three, say bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Number four, praise Allah. Say alhamdulillah for such and such and such and such that you've given me. And after that, he said, say astaghfirullah. And istighfar has an own avenue that we need to go into and the how-to for istighfar because it's not just as easy as saying astaghfirullah that's it no it has a very detailed avenue we have to look at Ali ibn Abi Talib says if you want to make dua there is one instance in Nahjil Balagha he states and it's very very beautiful if you look at it he says in Nahjil Balagha he says before you make dua first you have to salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Because that in itself is a dua towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we know this? And the Holy Quran states, In Allah wa malaikatu yusalluna ala nabi, Ya ayu alladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. So if we have this example in the Quran, that yes, this is a prayer, and Allah says, I answer this prayer. Ali ibn Abi Talib says it beautifully. He says, how can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when a person is asking him, accept a prayer or accept a dua and refuse the other. So he's saying whenever you want to make a dua, first and foremost, send your blessings towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, send your blessings towards the messenger and then make your dua because Allah will surely grant it. Now the third level I wanted to look at, and I'm already over time, but the third level I want to look at is the time frame in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you that which you have asked for. Because people have been asking for years upon years. A person asked Imam Sadiq, he said to Imam Sadiq, I've asked you numerous times, and I've asked Allah numerous times to give me such and such, and he still hasn't given me. And the Quran it states, if you ask from me, I will give you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it very clearly in the Quran. So he says, I've done that. I've asked him, Allah, he hasn't given me yet. And so Imam Sadiq replies very beautifully. He says, do you think Allah is untruthful? 
So he says, Astaghfirullah, that was Allah untruthful. He says, when Allah says in the Quran, do you think he's untruthful when he says it? He says, no. He says, then what may be the reason? Then the person begins to say, either it's not good for me at this moment. He may think that there's a better thing for me in the future. Or a better, let's say, time frame in which I should receive it. Or maybe something that I've done to veil this. Or maybe there's a sin for me to veil. And in that instance, the person replies to himself, he says, well, it, the problem is not with Allah, the problem may be with me, and that's why we need to. First and foremost, look at ourselves, brothers and sisters, and say from tonight, inshallah, that we can make dua by firstly looking at our sins and making istighfar towards Allah, never to commit them again. Number one, number two, inshallah, Allah accepts our duas because of the step that we will take towards Him, inshallah. And we want to make a dua when talking about the concept of dua, inshallah, tonight for all of the mu'mineen and the mu'minat al-ahya minhum wal-amwat to, to allow us to stay firm on the path of Ahl al-Bayt and not let anything shake us or shake our foundation and allow us to increase in the knowledge and the ma'rifah of Ahl al-Bayt and may Allah allow our du'as to be accepted and may Allah allow everyone here to be of the companions of Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman with a surat al-mubarakat al-fatiha but before a three we allow the salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad